So I've run into an issue, a little, a little conundrum, if you will. I don't know what I like in fiction books anymore, which is a really bizarre problem for me to be facing. I was the kid who like voraciously read, just flew through books. I used to get in trouble at my school for like walking in the hallway with a book open and my face buried in it, not paying attention to my surroundings. And when my parents needed to discipline me for like not doing my chores, they would take my books away. Like this was the child that I was. And this continued into high school for me. I'd like to say that my critical thinking skills got a little bit better. I got like a little bit more selective about what I read, but generally still, I just flew through books. Even if they were books that I didn't really enjoy, I would finish them and then go, hmm, not really for me. I won't continue with the series. Move on. It wouldn't slow down my momentum at all, right? But a strange thing happened. Um, and that thing is called college. I went to college. I was in my university's English program, which was very literature heavy. And then I also was doing this alternative general ed track that involved reading one to two books a week and having Socratic style seminars on them. And so depending on the semester and my course load, I was reading anywhere from one to three books a week for four years, which was a lot. <laughs> and it was a really positive experience for me. I learned a lot. It shaped my ability to read thoughtfully and engage critically with others' ideas. It broadened my horizons, yada, yada, all good things. But it also really burnt me out. So I went like a full four years without reading for enjoyment. I scrolled back through my Goodreads just to confirm this. And the only books I could find were, um, I think I read King of Scars at some point while I was at college. And I started Called on the Hawk, but I don't think I finished it. And ironically, I had to reread King of Scars later because I couldn't remember enough from when I read it in university. So I was basically not reading for an enjoyment at all. And then after graduating college, uh, a lot of things changed for me. I got married. I moved across the country. I said goodbye to a lot of my loved ones. Uh, not forever goodbye, hopefully, but just geographically, we were going to be very far apart. And some of the changes in that time were really positive and wonderful. I love being married, but some of them were really not. I was the most isolated I'd ever been. I really wasn't happy um, where we were living. And I became very depressed. I didn't realize how severe it was until I started seeking help much later than I should have, months and months later than I should have. But I became very depressed. And if you have had depression or you love someone who does, then you might know that one of the kind of hallmark characteristics is you lose interest in the things that you love. And for me, it was really sad because I could actually feel that happening. It's not like I looked back one day and was like, oh, wow, I really lost my love for reading. No, I could just like feel it happening in the moment where, you know, there'd be a thunderstorm outside and I be curled up on the couch and I would think to myself, you know, this would normally be a time I would make myself some tea and curl up with a book, but I just have no interest in that. It, it doesn't even strike me as something remotely um, desirable or worth the effort and energy that it would take. And so, like I said, I started um, seeking help. I started seeing a therapist. And I can actually remember the first book I picked up from my TBR and started reading for enjoyment was while I was in therapy. So I did pick back up reading for enjoyment and um, I've been kind of playing catch up. So I've been playing uh, like cultural catch up, like trying to catch up on some of the books that are really part of the online book conversation. And then also playing catch up with my own personal TBR. In college, I kept like a short list of books I really wanted to read as soon as I could once I started reading for an enjoyment again. And so I, I was playing catch up on those two fronts. And I think I'm, I've come to the end of that. Um, I have read all the books I want to read to be in the know for the book conversations online. There's some I just won't read and I've accepted that. <laughs> and then I've also come to the end of my own um, personal shortlist. But what I'm realizing is that I don't know what I like in fiction anymore. I read a lot of nonfiction. I read a lot of memoirs. I read a good amount of like poetry. Um, and those are all, you know, kind of in their own sphere. But when it comes to fiction, I'm really not sure how to choose which books to pick up and which ones not to. I'm definitely feeling that I'm outgrowing YA, which makes sense. I'm in my mid-20s. I'm an adult with supposedly a fully developed prefrontal cortex, and um, I'm feeling more distanced from YA characters and kind of their the conflicts that they tend to have, which is not to say that I don't value the genre anymore. I think it is so valuable for getting young people into reading and for seeing themselves in stories. That's very important. 
But um, as an adult, I just find myself looking for different themes and um, older characters dealing with different conflicts. I did go back through my Goodreads to read list. I have Goodreads and Storygraph. It's a whole mess. I can't seem to give one up. <laughs> and so I just manage both of them. But I went through my whole Goodreads to read list and cleared house, which was really a multi-day effort because I've had Goodreads forever and there were books on there from when I was like 13 that now no longer sound at all interesting to me. But even then I had a hard time deciding what books to get rid of, what books to keep, um, what books I could realistically see myself picking up. You know, from the time I entered university to the time I started reading for enjoyment again, that's like a five and a half year span. And, you know, there's a really significant difference between 18 year old me and 23, 24 year old me. And so I've decided I'm going to do a fiction audit. It looks like a tier ranking. It essentially is a tier ranking. But the purpose for me is figuring out, you know, the books that I've enjoyed the most in the last three ish years. I think the earliest one on here is from 2021. The books I've enjoyed most in the last three years, uh, do they have any commonalities that I can then look for when I'm choosing new books? And the same for the books that I rank lowest. Are there commonalities that I should really just try to avoid moving forward? The books I've chosen to include in this are most of the fiction books I've read in the last three-ish years, but I have excluded some. Um, I've excluded some classics because to me, um, I'm more likely to pick up a classic just because it has endured the test of time and I want to experience the themes and the author's writing, um, regardless of whether it's like to my personal taste or not. I've also excluded some short story collections because I am trying to get more into reading short stories. And so I'm much more forgiving of them because I'm still trying to figure out if I enjoy reading short stories and if I do, what kind of short stories I enjoy, what authors I enjoy. So I've left those out as well. And then for some series I've read, I've kept all of the books of the series because they're all um, very likely going to be ranked differently. And then there's at least one series that for me, just all of the books are kind of uh, universally in the same tier. So I've just included one book. Um, I can't remember if there's one or two series that are like that. But that is how I decided what books to include on the list. Um, they kind of are, uh, they span a wide range, I would say. There's some very different books on this list, and it kind of feels weird to compare them. Um, but that's the point, is that I don't just want to tier rank the fantasy that I've read, because there's things I enjoy about certain fantasy books, there's things I don't enjoy about certain fantasy books, and I'm curious if those carry over into other genres of fiction as well. Okay, so really quickly, we'll go over the different tiers, and then I'm going to transition to uh, being in a little web camera in the corner of the screen as we do the tier ranking. But as I put together this list and thought about what tiers I could see myself sorting them into, um, I'm not really sure why I didn't really set out to do this, but what made the most sense to me was like the types of relationships you have with people. And so the bottom tier is your existence makes me want to commit crimes. Um, with books, of course, this is book crimes, like setting a book on fire very serious criminal activity. Pretty self-explanatory. I had a very bad time. I wish I could light you on. The next tier up is I've already forgotten you. Also pretty self-explanatory. I don't remember much of what I read, if anything, which means you did not leave an impression. And um, that's not a positive thing. Books should leave some kind of impression on you. The next tier up is we're pleasantly acquainted. Sometimes you meet people and there's just not a spark or a connection. Uh, they might be a perfectly fine person. You might see why other people really like spending time around them, but you guys just don't click. And that is the kind of books that end up in this tier. Um, I might totally understand why other people like them. I might not have strong negative feelings toward them, but you just weren't for me. The next tier up is happily in the friend zone. This is for books that I had a good time with. I might even reread them. They might sit on my shelf as a happy reminder of the time we had together. And then the last tier is marry me. I do think it says a lot about my personality that it goes from happily in the friend zone to marry me. Uh, but I am married. I haven't dated in a long time. So there's no dating tier. It's either you're my best friend forever or you're my best friend and my spouse forever. <laughs> but yeah, the books in this tier are ones that I absolutely loved that I already have reread or plan to reread that I had such a fun time with that I really appreciated. Um, yeah. And then finally over to the side is a silo that is fully outside of the tier ranking system. And it's called, I'm thankful for the experience, but I did not enjoy myself. 
when I say this is outside of the tier ranking system, I really mean it. And I do feel the need to emphasize that before I start shuffling books around because I think we're going to get an odd mixture of books in that silo, but it does need to exist because um, sometimes I read a book and once I walk away from it, I'm glad that I have had the experience, that I know what is in the book, that I've thought about the content of it, but for whatever reason, I just did not enjoy the actual experience of reading it. And that can be for a variety of reasons. It can be for more negative reasons or more positive reasons. It could be because the time wasn't right and I should have read it at a different time in my life and maybe it would have ended up in a, you know, a happy tier. Um, So yeah, I just feel the need to emphasize because I don't want people getting angry at me (laughs) that the silo is um, not a negative one, not a positive one. It's neutral and I'll explain each book that ends up in there. But yeah, without further ado, uh, let's start tearing in these books and see what we can learn about my taste in fiction as an actual adult. Hi, hello. I just realized I never clarified that this video will be fairly spoiler free. Um, pretty much entirely spoiler free. And I think the only times that I talk about specific details are one, when it's a book I really didn't like and I wouldn't recommend regardless, or two, uh, near the end when I'm like comparing books a little bit. And I usually say, you know, at the end of the first book of this series, this is revealed. So um, yeah, proceed freely. Okay, hello, we are here. These are our tiers. Um, I have a monitor, which means I'm gonna be looking like this for most of the video, but you're here for the tier ranking, not for my face. It doesn't really matter. Just don't feel hurt that I'm not making eye contact. Also, my mic is like pinned to me and um, I have no idea how that's going to sound. So we'll find out. (laughs) Uh, So here are our tiers and our little book friends. Um, I'm just going to go in order. Like I said, we've got uh, a range here (laughs) of uh, an interesting mix, you might say. Um, so we're going to start with T. Kingfisher's A House with Good Bones, which I made a video for. It's one of the only other two videos on my channel. I love this cover, and also the title is so good, A House with Good Bones, for a sort of horror novel. Um, this is a book about a woman named Sam who goes to visit her mother, who is seemingly not mentally well. She's acting like maybe there's a ghost in her house, specifically the ghost of her mother, so the main character's grandmother. I really enjoyed this book. I had a very fun time reading it. I would consider rereading it. Um, I liked the main character a lot. I liked the themes. I just thought some things could have been executed a little bit uh, a little bit better with a bit more sophistication perhaps and so I'm gonna put this in whoop, let me get a smaller there we go happily in the friend zone okay so next we have a court of thorns and roses by Sarah J Mass I don't need to give any kind of summary of this book you guys know um, this is when I said I was playing cultural catch-up this is definitely one of the books I read because everybody was talking about it I somehow missed it although I do believe it was published I actually have no idea what year it was published, but I think I might have been a high schooler at the time. I read it as a 24-year-old. Um... (laughs) uh, I'm glad I read this book so that I can understand when people reference it. I did not have a good time reading it. I am familiar with the later books. I did not read them. I started A Court of Mist and Fury and just it was so not enjoyable it was so not what I liked in a book and it wasn't even like a fun bad time it was just a bad time so I stopped reading it and I've listened to a lot of reviews and plot summaries since then so I'm very well acquainted with the plot of these books if the later books were in this list they would end up in your existence makes me want to commit crimes I just want to be clear about my Akatar opinions here I'm sorry if uh, you're watching and you love these books it's disappointing to me that the resolution to these books and seemingly to the Crescent City books as well because the third book of that just came out recently I've listened to a lot of reviews about it the resolution is just the good guys get the most power and that's how you win and to me that's not compelling that's not interesting and it's not fun I like to watch my protagonists struggle I like to watch them be underdogs I have to fight for what they want the third Crescent City book is literally a fetch quest where from what I understand I haven't read it like I said I've listened to a lot of plot summaries from what I understand it's a fetch quest where Bryce literally levels up a term that is used at one point in the text and gets all the power and 
man, it sure is a good thing that she's a good person, right? Because if she weren't and she was the most powerful person in the universe, then that would be a bummer. It's almost like people with a lot of power in our world aren't always good people. <laughs> so anyways, that's my little spiel. I do not enjoy the types of characters Sarah J Mass writes. I don't enjoy how she deals with sensitive subjects and I don't enjoy how she resolves her conflicts. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, the, the Assassin's Curse by Cassandra Rose Clark. This is a random book. This is a book I bought when I was like a tween because I thought the cover was pretty. And it is, it's very pretty. The paperback is a soft cover. And so like the sensory experience of it is also very nice. And I really enjoy this book, I do. It's high fantasy and it is um, the daughter of two pirates. So she, she is a pirate herself and her parents kind of run a pirate empire of sorts. And they try to marry her off to another pirate at um, a young age. I, I, I say a young age. I think she's like 16, which is young to be married, but she's not like a, a child, right? They try to marry her off to the son of another pirate family, and she runs away. And the family of the pirate she was supposed to marry sends an assassin after her. And through a strange turn of events, she ends up accidentally saving the assassin's life. And so he owes this like magical debt to her, like literally if she is harmed, it causes harm to him, and they're thrown together and they're trying to figure out how to break this curse. And it's fun. I actually would highly recommend it. I think the magic is very fun in it. Here, let me make it smaller again. It's going happily in the friend zone. I don't think it is quite marry me tier. No, I don't think so. But it's very enjoyable. I really uh, like the characters and the magic. Um, there's a second book called The Pirate's Wish. The Pirate's Wish, yeah. And I didn't include it in this list because it would also go happily in the friend zone. I just think these books are fun times. I would reread them. I have reread the first one and um, I do recommend them. They're kind of hidden gems. <laughs> okay, here we go. The Atlas Six by Olivia Blake. I made a video about this. Wow, we're hitting the only two videos I've made for this channel, Atlas Six and A House with Good Bones. We're hitting them right away. Um, I made a video, and so I don't think I need to explain myself. I have talked ad nauseum about this book, and it goes here. Okay, now before, this is called On the Hawk by Maggie Stewbotter, but I feel like it makes most sense to start with the first series, which is The Raven Cycle. I have used The Dream Thieves. There's four books in The Raven Cycle. The first one is called The Raven Boys. The second is The Dream Thieves. The third is Blue Lily, Lily Blue. And the fourth is The Raven King. I've chosen to use uh, the cover for book two for this tier ranking because it is my favorite in this series, but all of the books for me fall in the same tier. Um, I loved these books. I started reading them in high school and finished them I th in early college, I think. Um, or maybe after college. I don't, oh no, I finished them after college. For me, it's hard to evaluate these books objectively because they hold such a like nostalgic fond place in my heart. I do love Maggie Stiefvater's writing style. She's very good at this very sharp and succinct characterization. You, She's very good at conveying the idea of a character in like one or two sentences, which is brilliant. This series follows four boys from a prep school in Virginia and Blue, a girl <laughs> who becomes their friend. <laughs> I'm doing a great job summarizing this. Um, they're searching for an ancient Welsh king that uh, Gansey, one of the boys, believes is buried somewhere in Virginia and a lot of hijinks occur and it's a wonderful, very sweet series. I think in some ways it really does capture the feeling of being a high schooler and a feeling your future stretch out ahead of you and that being both really exciting and also very frightening and the way when you're a teenager you kind of feel like the world is ending when you graduate high school and um, yeah so I'm gonna put it in happily in the friend zone specifically because I do feel a little old for these characters now um, but I love them very much and I love the story very much which brings me to call down the hawk I haven't read um, the second or third book in this series yet I'm hoping to get to them soon but this series follows one of the characters from um, the Raven Cycle series named Ronan, follows him uh, after high school and uh, what's happening in his life and in his family. Uh, magic is involved and I love this book very much. I'm going to put it in Marry Me. Ooh, first Marry Me. Because when I read it, I felt so seen. <laughs> like one of the things that is being continually dealt with in this story is like, what do you do? 
after high school and in the Raven cycle, these kids kind of have the adventure of their life and then they keep living. And what happens next? And what happens when your friends move out of town and you're still living in your childhood home? I guess I don't have very concise thoughts about it, but I really appreciated the care that was put into Ronan's character and how he is coping or not coping with these changes in his life and with the reality of adulthood. It's sad and it's kind of melancholy, but um, very relatable. Okay, the next book. Woo, this is a controversial book on booktube, which I didn't realize when I read it. <laughs> Caraval is one of those books that I knew was popular enough and people referenced often enough that I wanted to read it. I also somehow own it. I don't know how I came to own it. I own only it, not the following books. So I read it because I wanted to just be aware of what was in it and I had an entirely pleasantly neutral experience with it. There were parts that didn't make the most sense, uh, but there were parts I appreciated and it just leveled out for me and I walked away from it feeling fine. <laughs> and it was such a surprise to me to discover that some people on booktube have very strong negative feelings about this book. So it's going in, we're pleasantly acquainted. I know, very controversial. <laughs> I don't mind a soft magic system. I really don't. I like whimsy. I just didn't mind a lot of the things that people seem to really hate about this book. Okay, Diana Wynne Jones, Castle in the Air. This is, um, it feels strange to call it a sequel, but I guess it's technically a sequel. Oh, oh it says right there, a companion to Howl's Moving Castle. Um, there are three books. There's Howl's Moving Castle, Castle in the Air, and I don't remember what the third one is called. There's, there's two companions to Howl's Moving Castle. I love Howl's Moving Castle. We'll get there soon. But um, I figured it was such a slam dunk. It was such a hit. I was sure to enjoy her companion novels. I did not. I really disliked this book. I kept trying to convince myself that I was having a better time than I was, but ultimately I really didn't enjoy it. It's set in kind of vaguely fantasy Arabia, I don't know. It feels uh, just uncomfortable sometimes in the portrayal of characters. The details are blurry for me now, but I know at the end two people end up getting together that uh, were very bizarre to me. There was a very bizarre choice at the end. So the only good parts of this book were when Howell and Sophie showed up and, um, oh, let me, I, this book makes me want to commit crimes. I wanted to like it, but, um, it was troubling. Children of Blood and Bone. This is another catch-up book for me. I had seen this book around, I'd seen enough people talking about it, and I had my own interest in it. Tomi Adeyemi is Nigerian-American, and this novel is um, inspired by Nigerian mythology. I did enjoy reading a fantasy book that clearly was inspired by a culture outside of kind of the typical, like, European, uh, Western European settings. But there were things that this novel really tried to speed run that I would have liked to have seen spread out over multiple books. There's a um, there's an arc that very closely resembles the arc of Zuko in Avatar The Last Airbender, which of course is a brilliant, masterful redemption arc. The author tried to do that in one book with a character and it just was not enough. It just wasn't enough time and it was also romantically motivated which gets into kind of messy territory so I'm going to put this in We're Pleasantly Acquainted. I don't have strong negative feelings. I hope the series got better as it went on but I did not continue it and I don't plan to. Okay next we have The Cruel Prince by Holly Black. Again a catch-up book. Everyone's talking about The Cruel Prince. There's fan art all over for it. There's tons of reviews. It's like a fairly divisive book and you know what? I loved it. I had a great time with this series. I really did. Um, you might notice that all three of them are here, so there's going to be some variation in my opinions. It probably helps that I read this book after reading Akatar, and in Sarah J. Mass's universe, the Fae are basically just superheroes. They're humans with superpowers that live forever, and seeing more traditional Fae in The Cruel Prince, following more traditional Fae rules, like they can't lie, um, salt and iron harm them. The descriptions of some of them being like very uncanny. I just had a really good time and I already said that I really like seeing my protagonists struggle for what they want and Jude really has to fight for what she wants in this world. Boop.
Okay, Daisy Jones and the Six, another catch-up book. This is just a book that a lot of people were talking about. Obviously, it's very beloved. Taylor Jenkins Reid is a hugely popular author, and I decided to give her a go specifically with Daisy Jones and the Six. I just realized that I, I was kind of giving plot summaries, and then I just gave up on that very quickly. Um, if you don't know what Daisy Jones and the Six is about, I, it's so popular. It's about the rise of a band, a, a rock band in the 70s, and then they fell apart and for a long time nobody knew why and so the book is written like a journalistic account of the band coming together and falling apart and it's like the full story, the full scoop of what happened. Taylor Jenkins Reid is really great at writing character voices. There's really complex interpersonal relationships happening here. There was just something about it that didn't quite click for me. So boop, boop, we're gonna put it in We Are Pleasantly Acquainted. I had a fine time. I have no hard feelings. I have some questions about the treatment of a specific character, but overall it was a fine experience for me. I just didn't love it. Um, finale, this is the third book of the Caraball series, and I'm just going to be very quick with this one. I don't remember um, most of it. I remember I had spoiled for me very early on who, what is his name? I can't even think. Oh, oh, Legend. Uh, Caraball is about this like traveling magical carnival competition thing that happens every I don't remember how many years and the guy running it is called legend and he, he he's a legend no one knows who he is woo and he's magical and I um figured out who he was had suspicions and then had those suspicions confirmed with a spoiler very early on so it like wasn't very exciting to me finale I think kind of goes off the rails with like the mythology of the world but I couldn't tell you much about it I have, I don't remember most of it. The Girl from Everywhere was published in, I think, 2016, a while ago now. It's about a girl and her father who sail in a ship that can travel anywhere as long as you have a map to it. And it has to be a map that was created in that place. So this is a universe where like all the fantasy, not all, but a lot of fantasy worlds are real. And as long as you have a map that was created in that fantasy world, you can travel to it in your boat. <laughs> it's magic. I don't know. I really enjoyed this first book. I mean, I say really, I had a fun time with it. I liked the concept a lot. I liked the character well enough. The storyline is really about her relationship with her father. Her mother died while her father was away on a sailing trip. He feels very guilty about that and he's determined to bring her back to life. But the main girl, whose name I don't remember, I'm not gonna look, uh, the main girl, her, she was a baby when her mom died. And so she feels like, you know, if we succeed, cause you can time travel in this world as well, <clears throat> which I'll get to in a second, but uh, she feels like, you know, if we succeed in bringing my mother back, then the life I've lived, the person that I am will cease to exist. And so this is like an existential conflict for her. She wants to see her dad happy. She's only ever known him just consumed by grief and addiction and um, motivated by this, this guilt to, to bring her mother back. And so she wants her father to be happy, but she also wants to live, understandably. And so that's kind of interesting. I liked that in this book, they didn't fuss too much with the rules of time travel. Obviously the father believes that he can change the future by changing the past, but that's one of the really big questions of like, is there even a way to do that? Or is everything you do already determined and the only ways you can affect the future are ways that the future has already been affected, right? So I appreciated that it didn't get too lost in the weeds with those questions. The sequel we will address when we get there. I'm just putting this in, we're pleasantly acquainted. It was fine. Okay, <laughs> the great. I'm so ashamed of where this is going, but The Great Gatsby, I read at the wrong time. I absolutely read at the wrong time in my life. I need to reread it. Um, I am glad I read it, but I did not have a good time, and I'm begging you to not think too hard about me putting it in the same silo as A Court of Thorns and Roses. They're there for very different reasons. Um, I understand the cultural value of The Great Gatsby. I just need to reread it when I'm in a better state of mind and more ready to appreciate it. Let's move on. <laughs>
The House of the Spirits by Isabel Allende. This book is about three generations of women in a family, and I don't even really know what to say about it. Uh, magical realism is a very big part of it. It's very much about their family and also about the, um, the political changes in Chile. I misspoke here, so I'm just going to briefly voice over while my past self talks out of sync <laughs> with my voiceover. This novel is not set specifically in Chile. It's in an unnamed South American setting. Um, and it just follows generally the social and political changes of that country as it transitions from a very class-based system, an oligarchy, to a Marxist revolution. And so the generations of women all are kind of in different eras of this country's political history. And you watch how they interact with those political systems. And as women, um, obviously what they're culturally expected to do and how they move through the world and express their strength and their independence in the ways that they can within the political and social systems that they live in. So it's really an incredible book um, just for the setting that it is in, but it is so much about these characters and their lives and their relationships with other characters in their family. And like I said, it's very much about these three generations of women. And I just really loved it. This for me is a marry me book. Okay, next we have Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne Jones. Easily a marry me book. If you are only familiar with the Howl's Moving Castle movie, which is wonderful, no, uh, I'm not criticizing it. The book is really quite different. And I read the book before I watched the movie and I was really surprised by Howl turning into a giant bird. <laughs> That's not in the book. <laughs> I mean, what is there to say about this book that hasn't been said already? It is so much fun. Sophie and Howl are very fun characters to follow. They're very distinct and memorable. I love that Sophie gets turned into an old woman and she's like, well, I guess I'll nap now. <laughs> like, I just relate to Sophie so much. I like the soft magic system. Like I said, I am totally okay with soft magic systems. I think they're fun and whimsical. Yeah, I am a huge fan of this book, putting it right into Marry Me. This is a really random book, I'll Watch the Moon by Ann Tatlock, my friend, and I read this together, and I gotta be honest, I've already forgotten. It's about a family, a family in, it's about a family that runs kind of a boarding house, so they have a bunch of, you know, different characters living with them, and it's post-World War II. Her brother gets polio. I remember being moved by this book, but not moved enough to remember it, clearly. The Witcher, The Last Wish. I'm going to do these both at the same time, I think. I have The Witcher, The Last Wish, and The Witcher, Sword of Destiny. I... Am I going to make enemies with this video? No one watches my videos. It's fine. I'm thankful that I read these. I didn't enjoy myself. And part of that could be I listened to these on audiobook and find the narrator's voices for women. Bold choices are made, I think. <laughs> and they're not the kind of bold choices I enjoy. I was kind of um, surprised by the structure of these books and the way stories are told. I think I might enjoy reading them in physical form more than listening to them in audiobook form. I don't know why I kept both of these because they go in the same little silo, but who knows? The Mind of Past Emma is a mystery. Legendary by Stephanie Garber. This is the second book in the Caraval series and it goes in the same place as Caraval. We're pleasantly acquainted. Yeah, I really... I... I... I I don't have the same negative feelings a lot of people do about these books, and that's really all I have to say. So Caraval follows Scarlet, one of the sisters, and Legendary follows Tella, or Donatella, the other sister. And Tella is a much more active character. People like to criticize Caraval because Scarlet is uh, anxious which is relatable. <laughs> Maybe that's why I was fine with it. And Tella is much more um, outgoing, decisive, bold. And so um, 
it didn't really succumb to second book syndrome. I read the whole Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children series. So this is Library of Souls. It's the third one. I say series, I mean trilogy, the original trilogy. I started these when I was younger and as an adult, I just wanted to finish them and see if they held up because I remember really enjoying them. These books, uh, when they came out, there was a lot of buzz around them because they included these old kind of fantastical photographs, which is really fun as a concept. These books are about peculiar children. So children with peculiar abilities. I don't really know. These books for me are very forgettable and actually um, so there was the original trilogy and then they were popular enough that the publisher asked Ransom Riggs to write three more. So the original three book series which was complete on its own got expanded into six books and they undid a lot of stuff they did in the original three and I really don't like when authors and publishers do this and so if I had finished those three, they would be going into your existence makes me want to commit crimes on principle alone because when you write a complete arc, a, com a story that is um, narratively satisfying and then you undo those things, not in a way that makes sense. Like, of course, people change as they get older. The person you date when you're 16 is not the, necessarily the person you spend the rest of your life with, of course. But when you undo things just for the sake of undoing them and not because they narratively make sense so that you can publish more books and make more money, I don't like that. Uh, Ransom Riggs did it and also so did his wife, Tahir Mafi, who wrote the Shatter Me series. Um, which was also originally a trilogy and then got pushed to six books. Interesting little husband-wife thing going on there. <laughs> I didn't read the full um, second trilogy. I think I read book four and got frustrated and gave up. Like Water for Chocolate is a story set in Mexico at I, th I think it's like turn of the century 1900s and it is about a young woman named Tita. It's mostly about her. It's actually about her family um, who are all women if i remember correctly the mother is the matriarch and she kind of uh, rules with an iron fist and tita wants to get married to her love but because she is the younger sister her older sister has to get married first her older sister whose name i believe is rosa and rosa ends up marrying the man tita is in love with and so it is a kind of a, a poignant story of young love and family but it is also about food and in this book tita is a cook and she also is magical. So she infuses her food with magic, which is a very fun concept. And the descriptions of the food made me very hungry while reading it. Like I've said, I enjoy magical realism and I enjoy when it serves a specific purpose. And I liked the idea of this being when we cook things, we are creating things with ourselves, right? And magic being an extension of that is a very cool concept to me. So I'm gonna put this in Happily in the Friend Zone. Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher. This is the second T. Kingfisher book on the list. I adore this book. Nettle and Bone is very popular. T. Kingfisher kind of writes shorter novels. And so this book follows Mara. Oh my gosh. How do I summarize this book? This book is about um, Princess Mara. She is the youngest of three princesses in a small harbor kingdom. The queen runs the kingdom. Their father is not alive, I don't think. The Harbor Kingdom is very small but highly desired because they have a harbor and so there's a northern and southern kingdom that kind of jockey for alliances with them. Mara's oldest sister gets married to the prince of the northern kingdom and w within a short period of time uh, dies. And Mara and her oldest sister were always very close so this has a very um, big impact on her. And then her the middle sister, so her next oldest sister, gets married off to the same prince to maintain that alliance and Mara is very scared for her. When she travels to see her sister, when she and her mother travel to see her sister in the northern kingdom, her sister is really unwell. She's had a lot of miscarriages and is very clearly being physically abused by her husband and Mara resolves to save her sister from this situation. And so it's a really, I think, a very sweet story about sisterhood. And also there are a lot of women characters in this book and this kind of repeated theme of what women do to help each other in systems of oppression. Because of that, it's very touching. It's a, it's a standalone fantasy novel. And there's some, I would say, narrative choices that could have been um, ironed out a bit, made a bit more smooth. But at the same time, I just, this book is, um, 
I just remember it so fondly. It goes and marry me. <laughs> I guess now is a good time to mention that I am a pretty liberal DNFer. If I'm having a bad time with a book, I have no compunction about setting it down and just not finishing it. So I do expect there to be less books in these lower two tiers, simply because I'm not counting DNFs in this list. Like I said, I started reading Aquamath and I didn't finish it, but if I had, it would have gone here. <laughs> Okay, A Pocketful of Crows by Joanne M. Harris. This is a book that I own. It's gorgeous. This picture doesn't really capture it. It's like this, um, it's like gold leaf on the cover and it's like a canvas cover. It's really pretty. And I always get it confused with, there's like a book about ravens. An Enchantment of Ravens. There's some, there, like the popular, I have no idea what Enchantment of Ravens is about, but I know people mention it often enough that I get it confused with A Pocketful of Crows. Anyways, this is a book, I don't know how to describe this book actually, it's very folk-ish, um, very magical, very lyrical, and very cyclical. And so I don't really want to say a lot about it, it's a very beautiful, satisfying read, and I'm going to put it happily in the friend zone. Purple Hibiscus, this is a book written by a Nigerian author. It is set in post-colonial Nigeria. You can read it kind of as a companion to Achebe's Things Fall Apart, which is of course about pre-colonial Nigeria and the coming of colonialism and the destruction that causes. And then this novel is about post-colonial Nigeria and the dissolution of a family unit. It's very much about uh, a young girl and her family and I this <laughs> this book for me also goes in the I'm thankful I read it but I did not enjoy myself this book if you're going to read it has a fair amount of domestic violence and abuse and um, is a painful read but really valuable I'm very glad I read it it was just it was a, a difficult experience and so to tier rank it somehow would be very hard for me <laughs> the Queen of Nothing, such a, uh, like, such whiplash going from one book to the next. The Queen of Nothing by Holly Black, this is the third book in the, um, is it called The Folk of the Air? It's the third book after The Cruel Prince. There's not a lot I can say about this book without spoiling plot points in the earlier books. There is a decision made in this book that some fans really didn't like because it meant that a favorite character was not on page very much. I really liked that decision. I really liked that Jude had to grow into her role as an individual and not as attached to someone else. Speaking vaguely here because I don't want to spoil anything. I really, yeah, I respect the decision that was made and um, I had a fun time. This goes in happily in the friend zone. Rule of Wolves by Lee Bardugo. This represents both Rule of Wolves and King of Scars. I read both of them. It's hard for me to be objective about these books. Similarly to The Raven Cycle, I had such a great time reading these because I loved the books when I was in high school. I, I've loved these characters for a long time. And Lee Bardugo's writing is genuinely very good. Um, she's a very good writer and her character choices are really wonderful. As an adult, I don't know that I would have picked these books up. It's hard to know, of course, but I just don't know that I would have, yeah, picked these books up and had as enjoyable of a time if I didn't have that background. So I'm going to put it in Happily in the Friend Zone, but both this and The Raven Cycle get kind of caveats. Um, these are YA books that are um, very colored by my younger self's love of them. Okay, random. <laughs> I read The Scarlet Pimpernel because this is one of my dear friend's favorite books. This is a book about um, revolutionary France and The Scarlet Pimpernel is a character. He is a man who is um, s sneaking aristocracy out of France because of course people are being guillotined every day for being members of the aristocracy. But he's called The Scarlet Pimpernel because a pimpernel is a type of flower. He leaves notes with that as his little call sign and no one actually knows his real identity. And so um, the book is kind of about people speculating about his identity and also trying, you know, French authorities trying to figure out who he is and catch him and execute him. There's a specific type of character in this book. The character of the Scarlet Pimpernel is the t a type of character that I really enjoy seeing written and I rarely see written well. This is an older book and includes some stereotypes about Jewish people that is not uh, super fun <laughs> to read. 
And I also think, you know, the whole first half of the book, there's a lot of like fun suspense and back and forth, guessing who the Scarlet Pimpernel is, guessing what's going to happen next. And then once you know his identity, it just kind of slowed down and was the back, the back half was a lot less enjoyable. So I'm putting, we're pleasantly acquainted. I'm very glad I read it. I totally understand why people love it. It's not quite for me, um, but it had things that I very much enjoyed. The Secret History by Donna Tartt is a book that was on my like personal shortlist. I guess I haven't been saying, a lot of these books were on my little personal shortlist TBR, and then a lot of them were obviously part of my like <laughs> cultural catch up. But this was one of the ones on my personal TBR that I finally got around to reading. The Secret History, of course, is critically acclaimed. There are a lot of reviews about it. Much has been said about it. I doubt I have much to add. But The Secret History is structured like a Greek play. So the opening chapter actually tells you what's going to happen. And it opens by telling you that five of these classmates have just murdered the sixth. And so you're left wondering, how? Why? <laughs> Why would you as an undergrad student be motivated to murder your peer and then cover it up? So the whole first half of the novel is leading up to that point, and then the second half is the repercussions and how they all deal with this moral evil that they've committed. But I really enjoyed Donna Hart's craft in this book. It's an excellent story. I um, have already reread it. Okay, The Ship Beyond Time is the sequel to, where is she? The Girl from Everywhere. So, time traveling boat. In this book, they do very much so dive into those questions of whether you can change the outcome of the future. This book also introduces a character whose name you might recognize, James Cook. Hi, Editing Emma here. I want to just voice over this section and be a bit more clear because it's been a while since I read this book but it left such a terrible taste in my mouth that I got a little flustered speaking about it and trying to articulate why it was such an unpleasant reading experience for me. Now, like I said, in this book, James Cook is introduced as a character. Um, James Cook was a British mariner. He was a sailor, and he was sent to explore and survey lands in the Southern continent, especially Australia. And while there are certainly other figures we could point to who were more egregiously violent in kind of the colonial enterprise. James Cook's name is known and his legacy is known as being kind of the stone that started the avalanche of colonization and genocide in Australia. And so there's just a very painful legacy there for Aboriginal peoples. And I really struggle to understand why this author thought it was necessary or productive to bring him in as a character. And the main character, Nyx, actually ends up saving his life. And she has a bit of internal monologuing about being aware of his legacy and being aware of the pain and bloodshed that comes after his voyages and in the wake of, of his exploration, quote unquote. But it's really shrugged off and it's not treated with the nuance and depth that it would really need to be. There's a, a Goodreads review by a Native reader who says that they think that theoretically that it could have been a, an interesting dilemma, right, in, in talking about these books that are about time traveling. But it really should have been treated with a lot more nuance, a lot more context, and maybe just not been treated at all, right? When you're writing fantasy, the world is your sandbox. You can do whatever you want. And so part of why this left such a, it just left me kind of sick to my stomach is because I just really struggle to understand why this would be the historical figure that the author chose. Especially when the first book, I don't think I touched on this much earlier, but the first book is set in Hawaii and it does deal with questions of colonization, or not questions of colonization, that's a weird way to phrase it. It takes a very honest look at the pain caused by colonization and the damage done to the original communities of those lands. And I thought I'm, I'm really not the person to judge whether that is as nuanced and thoughtful of a, a treatment as it should have been, but it was certainly more sensitive and more nuanced than whatever is going on in The Ship Beyond Time. So yeah, I think there was just this really gut-wrenching feeling to reading this book and, and seeing that that's the direction it was going in and just thinking, why? You know, why in a world of choices available to you? And clearly being an author who has thought about 
colonization and genocide and the long-lasting suffering inflicted on indigenous communities by European powers, I just, I just really can't wrap my head around why this is the decision that was made. So I just wanted to clarify that and articulate it a little better than I think I was able to in the first recording. I, I don't really have much more to say, actually. Um, this book, ooh, very random, Sora's Quest by T.L. Schreffler. This is the first book in a long series. I don't know, are there six books? I discovered these books in high school, like early high school. These are self-published by the author and are about a character named Sora who goes on a quest. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> no, it's, it's high fantasy. Sora is like a what's the word? I don't remember what her father is, but she's the member of the aristocracy of her land, basically. One night, an assassin kills her father, and she had already been planning on running away that night, and so she's going, you know, her dad's just been killed. They didn't have a very uh, loving relationship. She's running to go get her bag so she can run away, which girl, that looks really guilty, <laughs> but she's doing it. And as she's getting her bag, she actually runs into the assassin himself. And she's like, oh my gosh, he's gonna kill me because I've seen him. And so she says, uh, take me with you. You know, I'm already planning on running away. Just take me as your prisoner, please don't kill me. He kidnaps her <laughs> and a, a little quest adventure ensues. Like I said, I discovered these books when I was in high school and so there's a lot of nostalgia for me there. I started rereading them last year and the writing is n not great, I would say. Um, I know that when you self-publish, there's a lot less access to like, industry editors and I, I fully understand that, but I do think the level of writing is um, a bit repetitive, not incredibly sophisticated. There are these moments that shine for me. I haven't finished the series yet. I don't even think the last book is out yet, but there are these moments that really shine. And I think something I can say that I do really appreciate is she doesn't fall into tropes very often or really at all. When you hear girl tells assassin to kidnap her, you might think, oh gosh, here goes the romance. And uh, no, Sora spends the first book very afraid <laughs> of the man who killed her father and kidnapped her. But she's also kind of been thrown together. There's a magic element later where they can't really be apart. And so she feels this fear and loathing towards this man, but also he is kind of a protector of her. And eventually there is a mutual respect that grows. And later in the series, maybe a romance happens. I don't know, I don't wanna spoil anything, but I think it's handled really well in a way that we don't often see in books today. So for all of that, I'm going to put it in We Are Pleasantly Acquainted. I have such nostalgia and fondness in my heart, but um, trying to reread the, these as an adult was quite difficult. The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. What to say about this book? It's a story about stories. In this book, a young man named Zachary Ezra Rollins finds a book that records his life, or records a, a story from his life. He's understandably very shaken by the experience and he goes searching for answers. And this book is so lush. The details that she chooses to highlight are so atmospheric and I would call this like light academia almost, just celebrates the beauty of the human experience and celebrates uh, what it means to be a story. I just, I just love it. Oh, we're ending? Okay, we're, this is an interesting note to end on. Vicious by V.E. Schwab. I would call this a superhero novel for dark academia girlies. It is in a university setting and it is the story of these two young men who are academic rivals but are also best friends, kind of. <laughs> it's about these two young men becoming EOs or extraordinaries or you know, shorthand superheroes. <laughs> and so they gain these extraordinary abilities. Their relationship turns very sour very quickly. This book is most enjoyable if you age the characters up in your brain, which is what I did. Um, it does not make sense for this to happen in an undergrad setting, and I'm not sure why the author chose to do that. It makes a lot more sense if they are in a master's program or a PhD candidates, just truly. But I really liked this book. I really enjoyed reading it. I had a good time. It's happily in the friend zone. 
I'm gonna, I plan to continue um, this series. There's one more book, and I think the third book actually isn't even out yet, but um, I own the second book, which is called... I don't know what it's called. <laughs> okay, and then the last book on my list is The Wicked King by Holly Black. So I separated all three books of this trilogy out because The Wicked King married me. <laughs> I had so much fun reading The Wicked King. I am so pleased that Holly Black did not fall into second book syndrome with this book. It is so fast paced, so full of plots and schemes, so full of the status quo changing. I just think it is such a delight. I really like Jude as a protagonist and watching her really go through it in this book makes the resolution to her story that much more satisfying. Yeah, a great time. Well, astute viewers may notice that this is an entirely new day. I always wanted the last chunk of this video to be me making comparisons between the books that I ranked most highly to see if there are little insights I can draw about what I tend to really like in fiction books. But it turns out that that's really hard to do on the cuff and there was a lot of me staring at the screen and going, uh, well I think this book and this book have this in common. Well, hmm, I don't know. It was really not very gripping media. And then also to add to the mess of it all, my audio was kind of messed up and echoey. So I'm just refilming it. I have sat down and done some comparative work and really thought deeply about the books. And I have some really kind of fun insights and I'm really excited. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna go over that a little bit. All right, so this is a little like comparative chart I made where I just listed the elements of the stories that really stuck out to me that I really enjoyed. I'm not going to go through like each bullet point beneath each book because I've already talked about the books and what I enjoyed about them. I'll just mention a few things. The first observation is that fantasy is definitely still a love of mine, an interest of mine, it always has been, and I was kind of wondering if I was growing out of it or not, and that does not appear to be the case. All but one of these books contain magic of some kind, The Secret History, and even The Secret History, you can argue, plays a bit with the supernatural, the transcendental. It's kind of a central plot point as the final bullet point under The Secret History says that definitely pushes at the boundaries of the natural and really questions the reader's understanding of what is real and what is not. But for the remaining six books, um, most of them have a fairly soft magic system. So I think I actually don't enjoy magic systems that are really clearly defined and structured and are kind of systems in the world, if that makes sense. For example, the Atlas Six, which is a very poor example of a magic system in my opinion, but it tries to be very kind of systematized and structured with defined lines. And for me, I think I'm much more interested in magic as an expression of the world the author is building or the characters. And that might sound like, Emma, you kind of just said you didn't like that. But what I mean by that is, for example, in Howl's Moving Castle, in Nettle and Bone, in The Starless Sea, in The House of the Spirits, and kind of in Call Down the Hawk. That's, um, I'll get there in a moment. But magic is used in service of theme and story, and it doesn't just exist for the sake of magic existing. So for example, in Nettle and Bone, there is a lot of magic, and one of the types of magic is in ble like blessing and cursing. And so there's the kind of stereotypical, or maybe not stereotypical, archetypical um, fairy godmother figures, and they bless children at their birth. But these Figures don't just exist just to be there or to add flavor to the story, but really to tell a story about the characters themselves. The way these godmothers use their abilities to bless or curse or withhold their abilities or are used by other people 
is really telling a story about their agency in the world and their sense of responsibility for the power that they have. And it's used to show them making the choices that they are able to make within the systems that they're in. So that's speaking broadly because I don't want to spoil like something happens right at the very end that's like, oh my gosh, that's such a cool kind of reversion of expectations. But the magic is used to tell this story about who they are as people and to kind of complete this overall narrative. And so I think for me, magic just existing in a book certainly is not enough for me to care. But when it is kind of secondary to and in service of the themes and the, especially the characters, I think very much so when I look at this list, I see a lot of magic that is an expression of an individual. Another observation here is that I definitely like books with complicated relationships, especially familial relationships. I mean, just looking at this list, Called on the Hawk, the relationships of the Lynch brothers and also Jordan and Hennessy, these characters that are introduced, there's these very complex, dynamic relationships where affection and love and loyalty are tangled up with guilt and resentment and anger. And the House of the Spirits is very much about these complex familial relationships. Howl's Moving Castle is a middle grade book, <laughs> but I think even then, Sophie's relationship with her sisters, I think is handled fairly well. And if we wanna talk about the relationship between the two main characters, Howl and Sophie, that's a great example of a, um, of a relationship where there is a lot of just natural organic tension because of how different they are. And yet still there's such a sense of them working together, you know, at the resolution of the book. Little and Bone is about a sister relationship that is not overly sweet or saccharine at all. In fact, the, the sister that Mara sets out to rescue from her situation is one that she has never really felt very connected to, that has always been kind of harsh to her. And so there's this really interesting dynamic of, of loyalty and love, but also these really complicated feelings, which is not even to talk about their mother who is putting them in these really awful positions, but they still love and her relationship to them as both queen and mother and how those conflict. Um, the Secret History, not about family members, but you could call it like a dark found family. I don't know if that's a thing, but the students become very like codependently close to one another. Anyways, I could keep going. Um, not really The Starless Sea, but The Wicked King is about um, some complicated familial dynamics as well. So that definitely is something that shows up a lot and that I do really enjoy as I reflect on it. I just really like reading books where I think the a lot of the relational conflict just arises organically because of people's personalities and their loyalties to different things and their different priorities and values rather than like an external conflict being imposed upon them. Also, a lot of these books are about adult characters, especially I would say adult characters who are finding their place in the world. So they're not necessarily like fully established, settled adults, except maybe Nettle and Bone, Mara is in a place that she can see herself being long term, I guess, when the adventure starts. But for the most part, these stories have to do with younger adults who, yeah, like I said, are, are finding their place in the world and figuring out where they fit in, what life is going to look like for them moving forward. And I think I connect to that. And then finally, this is kind of random, but I do just want to make one note because I forgot to mention it earlier and I don't want to not mention it. I spoke very highly of the House of the Spirits. I still will speak very highly of the House of the Spirits. I do think if you are going to read it, just check out some content warnings. Violence Against Women has a pretty pervasive presence throughout the book. And I think Allende does that very intentionally and handles it with, in my opinion, a fair amount of respect and dignity. And it's not like voyeuristic, but obviously people have different metrics for that and people have different capacities for what they can read about on page. So check content warnings before you read it if you're going to. Okay, I'm not going to spend much more time here because I'm going to show a little chart that I made. Okay, look at this beauty. <laughs> I do it just where my camera is. But these are the, the kind of common threads I noted throughout a lot of the books. And what I did is I did the Marry Me tier you know, right here. And then these are all the books from my Happily in the Friend Zone because I wanted to see how they kind of um, ranked as well in terms of these common threads I identified. So we have complicated familial relationships and then mothers and or sisters specifically. So protagonists being sisters or a daughter and mother relationship that is 
very complex. And so I marked all of those off as well because that seems to be, like, it is, if you look at the ranking, more than half of the complicated familial relationships are specifically mothers and or sisters. And then this is an interesting one. So no romantic relationship or the romance is more secondary to the overall plot and the other relationships in the plot. So people might disagree with me. The Starless Sea kind of gets marketed as a romance book and there is a romantic relationship, but I would not call it a romance. I think it's much more about the fantasy, the stories, etc. So I think it's obvious from the books I show that I don't really read the romance genre, right? So it makes sense that this would be a category that has a lot of little checks in it. But at the same time, I do find that in some fantasy books or in some YA books, even though it's not marketed directly as a romance, the romantic relationship very much is central and plot kind of happens for the purpose of those relationships. That's frustrating to me. I don't enjoy that. I want there to be kind of a larger overall plot. I want the protagonist to have other meaningful relationships. But I do like um, seeing two characters who have a lot of chemistry and work really well together. I, I like that. I don't hate romance. I just don't want it to be the point of the story. And then we have character flaws are a driving force within the story. This is kind of what I was getting at with like relational conflict as well. I think I really like the momentum of a story to come from um, relational tension, the way characters play off of one another, and individual character flaws, right? And the decisions that they make that kind of drive the plot and introduce conflict. I don't have a total problem with external conflict if you look at the list of books. For example, just in the very first one, Claude on the Hawk, the kind of main threat of the book is an external thing that they're trying to respond to and deal with, right? That's fine. I'm fine with that. And for example, in like the Cruel Prince books, Jude's relationships to others and her own kind of internal quirks are very much what drive the momentum of the story, but also there is a lot of external plotting, pieces moving, situations changing, and seeing her navigate that and really think through how she's going to move forward. So external conflict, external factors happening to drive the plot forward, that's fine. I just also want to see the way that a character's individuality and their relationships with others factor into that as well. And then I put whimsy. Um, I don't actually have a lot in this row, but it is when I think of what I enjoyed so much about the books that are marked, whimsy is a part of it. And then we've already been over this, so I won't belabor the point, but softer magic system and or magic as an extension of a character's self. That showed up a lot, which is interesting. And then finally, slower pacing and great attention paid to atmosphere and detail. This is an important category specifically because these are mostly books I have found myself picking up in the last year, I would say. And I would mark this as something that I would not necessarily enjoy as a younger reader, but I do now. So it's an interesting like growth point, I guess. House of the Spirits, The Secret History, The Starless Sea, kind of House of Good Bones and Pocket Full of Crows. These are all books that take their time and really spend a lot of time on details, setting, atmosphere, setting kind of a tone and mood. And I have really enjoyed that and the immersion it creates. And to me, I can kind of luxuriate in the details rather than feeling the need like, okay, what's next? What's next? What's next? When is the next plot point going to happen? When is the next rising tension going to happen? When is the next twist going to happen? Like, I don't need that in these books because there is such a rich attention to detail that I can spend a lot of time with and explore and be immersed in. So those are the commonalities I picked up. I think it's really interesting to see that the saturation of check marks in the marry me category is much higher than in the happily in the friend zone category, which says to me I'm onto something here. The more consistently these things show up, the more I really enjoy the book. All right, well, this has been very exciting, very informative for me. I think I've identified some really helpful things that I can look for as I move forward in picking out fiction books as an adult. 
I definitely, again, mean no insult at all to young adult books. In fact, there were two on my Marry Me tier. I just think I'm getting a lot pickier about YA and really wanting to read more literary fiction and adult fiction, adult fantasy. And I'm really looking forward to branching out and exploring more of those books. I feel like because I kind of was tuned out of the book conversation for so many years, there's going to be a lot of books that come up that aren't like new releases that are just going to be books that I haven't heard of or maybe I've heard of only in passing but never really had the time to explore them. For example, I'm really looking forward to reading 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Marcia, Gar Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I kept switching consonants, goodness. <laughs> um, I've owned that book for a while and I really wanted to read it and I think that will be next on my list especially because I was reminded of how much I love The House of the Spirits, and that can almost be read as a response to 100 Years of Solitude. All I know is that 100 Years of Solitude follows three generations of men and involves magical realism, and I've already talked about House of the Spirits. You can see the parallels. But yeah, if you have watched this and you have recommendations based on the interests I've identified, please drop them below. I would love to hear them. Also, if there are other commonalities you noticed, I would love to hear those as well. I'm sure I missed things, but that is all. I hope you have a wonderful day or evening, whatever time it is for you, and I'll see you again when I see you again. Bye!